Hello, and welcome to another episode of Perfect Pairings. My name is Gayanne, she, her. And my name's Nicole, and my pronouns are she and her. We'd like to start today by acknowledging um, the traditional owners on which we are recording now and our next segment, the Wurundjeri people and the Tongarong people. Um, we pay our respects to their elders past, present, and emerging. We acknowledge the often fraught relationship between Australian farming and Indigenous land rights, and we acknowledge the contribution of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders people to the fibre arts community over the millennia. Today, it's very exciting because, hello Murphy, um, and a little friend over here. Um, I think you'd like to be on camera. You coming up, buddy? Yeah. Okay. Come on, mate. Up you come. Up you come. Come on. Well, we have been joined on the couch here by our production assistant, Murphy. Um, he is now snoring, so um, probably won't participate in the episode anymore. Um, but we have quite an exciting episode for you. So um, back to an interview today, and we're off on a road trip. Um, about an hour north of Melbourne to visit someone very special. Should we leave it there? I think so. Let's um, take it away. Well, here I am with Susanna Cartman. So you may not be familiar with her name. Um, you might be more familiar with, um, she often goes under Sana and Co. Mm -hmm. um, but Susanna is a an incredibly well-known designer, well-recognized designer. So she has been published in Pom in the latest issue of Pom Pom Magazine on the cover, no less, mm -hmm. um, in Liner, in their 52 Weeks of Shawls, um, in Making. She's also done collaborations with Brooklyn Treed and Bullfolk. And we're so thrilled to have her here on Perfect Pairings. So mm, thanks for having our vlog, Susanna. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for having me. Oh, absolute joy. Mm. So let's start right at the beginning. Mm -hmm. So you're, you're a knitter. You've mm -hmm. been knitting for quite a long time. Yeah. How did you first get into knitting? Um, through my grandmother, I, I would say. Um, she used to take me with her to these, um, like, women's groups like women's craft groups and um and her and the other older ladies there would teach me how to do the basic crochet i remember doing like a crochet chain that was like this long just chain because that's all i knew how to do so i think i actually learned the crochet chain first and then knitting but um that that kind of always um made me associate knitting with like community and women you know having a good time together so, yeah so yeah I love that story because mm. my initiation to craft was very similar. Um, mm. Just before we started, I was telling the story, which I think I told maybe in our very first episode around joining my grandmother at the embroidery mm -hmm. still, same yeah. sort of story. <laughs> so, um, yeah. oh, that's wonderful. So when did you sort of start really getting into knitting particularly as an interest mm. for yourself? Probably when I was about 12, I started actually knitting just just for knitting and not not because I had to we had to learn knitting at school in Finland as well so I did a little bit of knitting then as well and I remember knitting like a pair of socks and not enjoying it at all yeah and one was like this big and the other one was a little bit bigger I think my mum helped me finish it in the end I, I don't think I even kept those they were pretty horrible um but then um I have another grandmother who actually lived with us for a while actually my stepdad's mum um, and she was a knitter as well. And then because she was living with us as well, I was sort of learning more like different knitting skills from her. And that's when I kind of started really enjoying it and doing it for fun. So, um, but it, it's sort of been on and off. I was never really a super active knitter until probably 2005 when Ravelry came along. Ah, yes. Constant that's, inspiration. Mm -hmm, yep. Yeah. So that's when I actually walked into a yarn shop and didn't know what I was buying <laughs> at all. <laughs> Had some old needles from my grandmother, like some old metal DPNs that were really heavy and slippery and impossible. But um, so I bought some needles, I bought some yarn. I don't think they were even like a good match. It was drop cell packer actually, but the colors were beautiful. Um, and that's what got me started. 
um, and then knitting blogs, Ravelry. Yep. Yeah. And you're hooked. Yeah, yeah. So right. it's been ever since then I've been knitting more actively, but still there's been times when I've been knitting more or less. But yeah. yeah. So just before we started, mm -hmm. we were having a chat and you told me that you've actually only been designing professionally for three years. Mm -hmm. So you have covered so much ground in three years. You're on the cover of the latest your designs on the cover of the latest pom pom magazine, like mm. you, you really come a long way very quickly. Yeah, that was a real highlight. That, that <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, um, how did you, I guess, like get into designing? How did mm. you, how did you start to? Okay, um, I think I started when I was just knitting as a hobby. I would never follow pattern instructions fully. I would always want to change at least one thing, usually a few things. So that sort of got me, got me going with, you know, sort of designing in, in a small way, a very easy and accessible way. And, um, and then I, it just sort of grew from there. And then when I moved to Australia, I, I wasn't working full time at the time and then COVID happened. So I wasn't able to and um, that's when I sort of had the time to really think about doing it a bit more seriously. So I started submitting designs and they started getting picked up. So I just kept going. How wonderful. <laughs> and so yeah. now is it pretty much you're designing full time for your kind career? Of, yeah. 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 I also do some freelance um, graphic design work okay. um, yeah. for the Sami language um, oh, awesome. publications. Uh, I don't advertise it. It's not really what I'm focusing on, but I do that on the side as well. Yeah. Oh, wonderful. Hmm. How has your design work changed from when you hmm. first sort of started to submit to publications? Does it feel easier now? Not necessarily. Like every project is kind of unique and some ideas just just come sort of fully formed and they're really easy and you just go with it and it's done and then others you really have to like dig around and try to find an interesting new angle or yeah that but the process in itself anyway is kind of project to project there are a few things I always do but the order is not necessarily the same so sometimes I lead with the yarn and sometimes I lead with like a technique that I really want to often learn actually <laughs> yeah <laughs> so I often want to learn a technique and rather than by a pattern, I'll actually create a pattern around that technique. And that's actually the first, um, not the first pattern that I published, but the first one that I actually wrote a pattern for, that's the brioche um, scarf for Brooklyn Tweed. And uh, that came about because I wanted to learn how to knit brioche. I wanted to know what all the, what all the buzz was about. <laughs> so, <wonderful>. um, yeah. <laughs> you so, learned how to knit brioche yeah. and published a pattern. A pattern out of it. I yeah. mean, why, why not? I yeah. feel like I'm underperforming now. <laughs> why, why, do, why do things the easy way when you can do them the hard way? Well, that's right. Yeah. And so did have you done any sort of um, courses or anything in knitwear design? or you? Um, I did one course on grading patterns because that's mm -hmm. really, I think, the most technical part in, in designing is, is to learn how to grade. And I did an online course on Craftsy for okay. that yeah. I don't I can let you know and you can put it in the show notes yeah that'd be great mm. yeah so that was that was something that was quite tricky to learn I yeah. can imagine yeah. yeah yeah so let's talk about that first published design mm -hmm. um how did it start all right um it started with me wanting to learn to knit brioche that's mm -hmm. that was kind of the spark that started the whole thing. Um, and I often find that um, like following those sort of, like following your curiosity is a really good way to get creative. It's kind of a very natural, natural way to uh, get new ideas because you're interested in something mm -hmm. new. So interested in learning something new. So that, that works for me anyway. Um, so I looked on Ravelry for hours trying to find a good scarf that I like something that I really liked and I couldn't so I ended up designing one <laughs> of course as you do, as you do. <laughs> um, so this is actually the scarf here it's quite long 
Yes. With these lovely Well, tassels it was mm -hmm. not meant to be. As one. <laughs> <laughs> this yarn is 50% um, silk, 50% merino. And I had like a pound cone of it, I think. So that's why I chose this yarn because I kind of yeah. had it and I was like, I want to use it on something. And I wasn't sure if it was enough for a jumper. But it kind of grew in <laughs> in the blocking steps. <laughs> and it is very long. <laughs> but um, And it's got gorgeous texture. Ooh. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I actually really love it. Mm. Um but the colour is not really my colour and mm -hmm. it really is way too long. <laughs> <laughs> All but, right. um, but um anyway, while I was knitting this, um I was thinking that this is really um, Brooklyn Tweed sort of style and I had seen their submission calls before but I never had enough time to really submit anything before but then I think it was only about a week later they actually had a submission call uh, and the theme was architecture which is perfect for me because that's what I've been doing for the last 12 years so um, so that's when I was like alright I'm just gonna submit an idea for them and this was what I was going to submit, but um, I had to change it up a little bit more. And um, actually what it ended up becoming was this swatch here. And that was a swatch I, uh, I uh, knit for the, for the submission. And um, then from there, it morphed into this scarf here. Amazing. So it has the same shape as the original scarf. It's not as long. <laughs> <laughs> and this one added a level of difficulty. It's got it's got two colours, so it's two colour brioche and it has the subtle sort of striping. Yeah, I love striping that. With subtle stripes, yeah, mm. that's just gorgeous. And what I love about brioche is that you get two sides that look different as well. Just one of my favourite things. So so yeah, and tassels. I have a, I have tassels in in basically all my scarves, like like this one. Yeah, well. <laughs> <laughs> has a few. I love that they're like <laughs> delicate little tassels. They're just yeah. kind of like cute little tassels. Yeah. I really like the. But I guess easily, like you could just leave it out and then yeah. have it a bit more like of a yeah. streamlined look. Yeah. But yeah. Wow. So, and so yeah. this was published. Um. So it wasn't the first pattern that was. Published, yep. but it's the first pattern that I wrote. Okay, right. Like wrote properly. Right. Everything. Okay. Done properly, and it was actually. And so you were working on this in was it twenty 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 yeah. So while everyone else was busy making sourdough, yeah, you were getting a incredible design. Yeah. For <laughs> I actually did want to do sourdough as well. <laughs> But it never happened. We're I was too busy. too busy. But it was actually a really good education in pattern writing, doing it with the publisher yeah. for the first one because they have their own guidelines for how their patterns need to be written out. So it's like you get this sort of framework yeah. that you're working with. So yeah. so yeah, it was kind of good. And I guess it gives you an introduction to that tech editing process mm -hmm. and that sort of yeah. thing as well. Yeah. yeah, in a really professional way. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. Straight into the detail. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I had written out a pattern for this blue one as well. Um, but it's a pattern, like it's like a recipe type yep. pattern. And like, oh, okay, yeah, the real pattern is actually a little bit yep. more extensive. <laughs> one A4 page. <laughs> but um, yeah, maybe I'll write this one into a proper pattern one day as well. A bit shorter. Yeah. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> okay, well, unless you've been hiding under a rock, you probably recognise uh, the latest issue of Pom Pom Magazine and the incredible sweater on the front, which is Susanna's overlay. So can you, can we get a bit of background insight mm. as to um, how you approached um, designing the sweater? Mm. What's, your, what's your design process like? All right, for this, uh, this one was actually a really smooth design process for me because the theme was, it was late, well, it says that they're layers. Mm -hmm. um, and that's kind of how I design anyway. That's how I approach design is kind of thinking about the whole design in layers. And that's, that's why I think I love brioche because it naturally has the two layers of color. 
which is why I chose it. Like yeah. that was my straight away, like that was my first thing was, all right, it needs to be brioche because I can then layer in the colors. And um, and uh, looking at the mood board as well, they had, they had the, like they had a very strong color theme in the mood board already. So that was kind of made my life easier because choosing colors is quite tricky. And, and for me, I often find that um, the color choice is not as important for me as the other design choices because knitters are gonna make it in all kinds of different yeah. colors as well. And color is something that you can really change the way something feels like how a design comes comes across with the colors so mm. so if i can show a design in multiple colors and different moods i, I kind of love doing that as well yeah yeah it's hardly ever like a clear thing like yep this needs to be that it's always mm. like oh it could be these it could be that and then it's just like trying different things until yeah. you find something that works that's me anyway when you saw the pom-pom call out mm -hmm. um they give you a mood board you said mm -hmm. what, so what what is that like um it's just a range of colors and designs or so um for this particular one i i believe it was it was a pinterest board mm -hmm. with a bunch of photos and it's most often it's not just knits there's lot of other photos as well just to give you an idea of the mood I think probably well not to speak for them but I would say intentionally not to give too many specifics so it's more of an open-ended um, inspiration mm -hmm. for, for designers so yeah. um, so I find them really helpful because you get a really sort of um, a good like I find restrictions in designing help me I know some other designers prefer to have a bit more freedom, but I really like having those parameters that you're working with uh, to really focus on, on the design. Yeah. So. And so when you saw that mood board and you're mm. thinking, all right, I'll submit something, mm. where, where did you go next with, um, why did you pick a sweater, for example? Um, for this one, the, the type of garment actually didn't come straight away. So for me, the first, um, thought was brioche because mm -hmm. brioche naturally has the has the two layers of color that you can play with so um that was that was my first thought is i want to i want to do that I've, I've done that previously with brioche with the with the scarf yeah as well so um and it's a natural way for me to design is to think of the design as layers and having like a even not with brioche but you sort of think like you have a background layer of texture or something and then you sort of start designing motifs on top of it and then create that sort of interesting effect um so this theme was really really um a, an easy choice for me to design something for this issue yeah um so um so with the i think the sort of key of this design for me was to use intarsia like that was sort of once i thought of that um that's sort of when it sort of started all falling into place for me um and I did use a lot of swatches um, when so I started designing it. Yep. Did you start with swatches then, just playing around with swatches, um, or did you start with sketches? Or I actually started with sketches. I, I sketch on my iPad, and I, and I have a drawing program there, and um, and I just started sketching, um, sort of thinking of brioche, um, and even first I was thinking about how to break it up, and I. I have a couple of swatches like this one here. You can see I, I, I sort of tried um, like breaking up the rhythm as well and maybe creating like a, not just stripes, but creating a bit more of a mesh or ladder type texture. Yep. Um, but um, in the end, when I came up with the intarsia idea, I thought there started to be a little bit too much going on. So sometimes you just have to like, like you can't use all your all your wonderful <laughs> ideas in just one project so so maybe maybe you'll see this in a future project who knows yeah oh you saw it here first people <laughs> <laughs> yeah it might be coming who knows i do like it um so it often happens that when i start generating ideas for a project i start getting a lot of ideas mm -hmm. and uh oh, here's another one 
Oh, this one's got Vintasia already, but then I broke up the brioche with just a row of stockinette stitch. So that was another take on trying to break up the stripes a little bit. Um, oh, that one looks nice too, actually. I yeah. like that one. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so it might still come, who knows? <laughs> <laughs> but um, the more I sketched, um, it sort of became clear to me that it doesn't actually need, need that extra um um feature like it just need to simplify so first i come up with like a thousand ideas and i try them all and mix and match with different colors different combinations and then um eventually i start narrowing it down mm -hmm. and thinking about what's the what's the like what's the basic idea of the design and then you just go through the all, all the elements and go does does this support the main idea or does it not and then they just so it'll stay a go based on that. So it's as yeah. much what you leave out as what you're putting in. Yes. Yeah. It's actually hard. As mm. <laughs> it's actually hard. Because <laughs> I do sometimes um, really like my own ideas. <laughs> so, um, yeah, but you don't have to use them all in one project. Yeah. So try to remember that. <laughs> and so once, so you played around with swatches mm -hmm. and then what yep. was the next sort of stage in... Um, I guess hmm. building the sweater or yeah I think after I actually I think I did these swatches before I decided fully that it was going to be a sweater mm -hmm. I was playing around with making make maybe making it a shawl well but something with a little bit more of a bigger surface so where you can really like see those sort of big design lines and where they can really shine but I think sweater just came about because it was a good good canvas yep for for that design um and I really like him. So this is actually the, probably uh, going ahead a few steps, but this is actually the swatch I need. It's kind of exploring um, like all the different parts of the sweater. So it's got the side seam there. It's got the picked up stitches for the sleeve or the cuff. And it's got the short rows for the shoulder there and the picked up stitches for the... So it's basically got all the elements that are in the sweater, but they're just all in on this one weirdly shaped um, swatch and this is what I need to photograph for the design submission okay. um, to sort of pull it all together so that's basically uh, the sweater design in a nutshell but before I got to this one I actually did some trials so I really and this is just like a rough mm -hmm. eight ply yarn it's completely different but I was really just practicing the techniques and really figuring out what types of short rows work best and what sort of um, bind off is best for the shoulder and and, and this lovely one. <laughs> and these <laughs> ones are not testing colours, <laughs> colours, although it's not a bad combination, yeah. but um, not really for the for the theme. But yeah, so this, this was, I think this was the first swatch where I tried the, tried different shaping. When you send off your submission, mm -hmm. you send photographs, um, and and sketch designs mm -hmm. of, of what the yeah. sweater will look like. So I put together a, a submission with photos of the swatch, um, some written description, um, there'll be a sketch of the garment on a person, there'll be a schematic sketch with like all the techniques and notes on it as well, and uh, then yarn suggestions also. Right. So it's quite an extensive yep. package. <laughs> Definitely, mm. definitely a lot more to it than you think, I think, before you... Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I don't know what other designers do for submissions. I only know what I do. Yep. And it seems to work. Yeah. But um, it'd be interesting to see more of other designers' submissions as well. Well, and you they... can definitely see your design training there in the approach with the schematic design and, yes, and that sort of Yes, yes. I mean, yeah, I'm very much at home with um, visual communication. Yeah. That's kind of what architecture is as well. Like, all you're doing is... I mean, there are some short notes, but they're short and yeah. very, like, to the point. There's no long storytelling. So for me, it's very natural to, to um, convey information that way. And so when your submission has been accepted mm -hmm. and once you've stopped screaming and dancing around the room, <laughs> what's the next stage? Um, so then is the actual hard work. Yeah. 
of uh, designing. Often at that point, uh, there might be some notes from the publisher saying, um, we really like this design, but maybe we could do this little tweak, or they might say that some other designers are already using that yarn, maybe we can find another yarn from a different company, or like little things like that might yeah. happen. And, um, and after that, it's just get to work and there'll be a, a timeline for the whole thing set out uh, from the beginning. So then it's just writing the pattern, knitting the sample, and then testing is another big part of it. Yeah. Um, and with this one, this one was actually a very tight um, timeline. So I had to start the test knitting before I actually finished knitting the sample. Right. So while the test knitting was going, I was sending them progress photos of, of my jump and saying, wow. this is where I'm at. And I think one of them actually even finished her size one vest before I got through my sample. <laughs> so you are writing the pattern mm -hmm. without having actually knitted? Yes, I did that. Yeah. Um, I know there are like, there's definitely some designers prefer to knit first and then write the pattern. And I tend to want to plan ahead and have the pattern, like a rough outline of the pattern written, at least for my, for the size that I'm knitting. Yep. And then ideally I write the rough, rough pattern, then knit the sample and then go through the pattern and grade it and do all of that and then do test knitting. That's kind of a good, good way to do it, but sometimes the timelines don't really allow that. So. The vest was kind of a last minute suggestion. So when I was putting together the submission, I'd, I already had the whole thing like almost ready to go, but I was still playing around with my schematic because I kept like playing with different color combinations and I actually included like five different options in the submission, I think. I had the main one as, as the big one, but then I had like these little sketches with all different colors. Um, included as well and I and I think that's when I thought that this pattern um, might do well is when I couldn't stop playing with the colors myself like I just wanted to keep trying different things because it really changes the look a lot so in some of the versions I had a lot of black or or a lot of pink or or uh, some softer colors so, so so I was having so much fun with it myself um, that I thought that yeah I think others might might as well that's always a good sign um and the vest i think it was just a random idea i had and then i had it in those colors actually the two colorways that they chose are exactly the two colorways that i ha had as my like number one options for both of them so the vest was just a really quick um sketch and i really liked the colors and the idea of the vest and basically the whole idea design idea is all in the vest like the sleeves are just like an extra thing they don't actually add a lot of uh, value for the design itself so well, why not and uh, yeah they went for it they wanted to publish both so i was happy for that <laughs> <laughs> and so when you're doing the grading mm -hmm. you develop this all of the sizing um yeah yourself Yes, yep. yes. And yes. working with the um, guidelines of the yeah, magazine. Some, mm -hmm. some publishers have um, a specific size chart that they want you to follow. So all the garments, are, like in the collection, are yep. based on the same standards. Yeah. Um, so I have my own one as well, but they're kind of pretty interchangeable these days. So. When you're coming up with all the different sizes, mm -hmm. um, we're really interested, and we've talked a little mm -hmm. bit on our blog before about size inclusivity and mm -hmm. um, ensuring that um, there is a wide range of sizes mm -hmm. for um, for all people. Yeah. Um, how is is that quite challenging to work with those mm -hmm. um, ranges, or how do you approach that sort of? Is it is it the same as doing six sizes as doing nine sizes or? Um, yes and no. Well, I actually started designing garments when size inclusivity was already kind of on the forefront. So I haven't designed for less than nine sizes ever. Right. So it, it's kind of, for me, I don't know anything else. Yep. Um, so I am, but I am, 
putting a lot of trust in the in the size charts that are available and really hoping that um, that they are sized appropriately and in proportion to the actual body shapes. Obviously they differ as well, but it's not just, you know, where you make everything bigger in the same way. Like yeah, there's actually yeah, yeah. a lot of rules and and um, different ratios for different things, how how much they get bigger. Yeah. So um, yeah, for me, it's just a natural part of the process and all my uh, garments go up to, I think, 62 inch bust maybe. Yeah. Yeah. Now, whatever is in the, in the standard range, I don't actually have the skills to take it further than that myself. Yeah. But who knows, maybe, maybe one day. Well, and, mm. and so currently you're working with, there are size charts available mm -hmm. that yeah. kind of give those proportions yeah. and those ratios yeah. to allow you to do yeah. different sizing. Yeah. I guess we just need um, people, you know, who are mm. in a position to continue to do that, to, yeah. to do bigger sizing. Yeah. 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 That's wonderful. Mm. And yeah. when did you find out you were making the cover? Um... I think when everyone else did. Yeah. Yeah, wow. Yeah, I didn't know about it. Oh then. my goodness. Yeah. So you saw the Instagram release? Post. Oh, yeah. How exciting. <laughs> yeah. Was there champagne that night? Mm. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> when you're selecting colours for your own things, mm -hmm. or when you're selecting how colours play together, mm -hmm. you talked about how. Uh, Colour can change the look of something mm. quite distinctly. Mm. Um, do you have any sort of guidance for people when they're approaching, like if mm. they saw your, let's use overlay as an example, because yeah. that's what we're talking about, and they yeah. were like, okay, but I want to do completely different colours mm. to that. Is there any sort of colour principles that um, um, you often work with? or uh, There probably are, but to be honest, I'm not very, like, when I'm working with colour, I don't like consciously go through the principles. They really in the background. Yeah. I, I sort of go very instinctually with colour and just sort of start trying different things and and probably have some ideas of what sort of things work together, what sort of things I like. Yeah. So I would always, if I'm advising someone else, would start with like, what colours do you like? Yeah. Like, what makes you happy? What sort of colours is, is, if it's a garment, like... What colours do you like wearing? And, do and you go, sort of start building from there. Do you start to kind of just visually put yarn together to see how that's looking? Mm -hmm. Or do you tend to draw it out first and play with colour that way? Um, or? If I have the yarn, if I have the colours that I want, then actually for overlay, I, um, I do these little... This is how I actually tested colours uh, for the overlay. That's actually the vest that I'm currently knitting, but that's the test that I did for that. That's how I, how I did it. So it's yeah. just a garter stitch swatch. And then I crocheted the, oh, that's all the crochet that I've been doing lately. <laughs> <laughs> so I just crocheted the, the brioche knits on top. And it's a really easy way, because if you don't like the colors on top, you can just unravel it and do it again. So I have a couple of um, other color testing swatches. So these are just like, yarns that I had in my stash so they're not necessarily always the best ones or the ones that I want to use but it, they still give me an idea of what sort of colors might work and um, what looks nice together but yeah I I don't really usually know until I see like I need to see things and try them and then I'll know if I like it or not yeah. so I think testing is is a good way to go oh there was another one with a bit more black Susanna, your Instagram and Ravelry profiles talk about you being a Nari Sami, which mm -hmm. is the indigenous uh, culture or people of Finland, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so how does that background influence your work or what interests you about that part of your heritage? Mm, well, to start with, um, there's actually three different Sami groups mm -hmm. in Finland and Nari Sami is one of them, but it's the only Sami people that only live in Finland. Okay. And we're a very small group. There's only, I think, less than a thousand of us. Wow. Okay. Yeah, out of about 10,000 Sami people that live in Finland. So it's a very small, <laughs> it's a very small yeah. population. And I think 
you're talking about the language, there's only like less than 500 speakers. I think that's the most current number. So, and yeah. have you learnt any of the language? Uh, I have. I did a language school a few years ago and I did learn it somewhat. <laughs> I'm not fluent, but I do work with the language uh, a little bit. So I'm doing, doing um, my little bit to um, help the language survive. That's so, fascinating. Uh, yeah. Cool. So I think crafts are a very uh, important part of the culture still to this day. And there's a lot of traditional clothing and even utensils. There is also hard crafts. So there's like handmade, oops, it's a bit tight, handmade knives. So there's reindeer horn and timber and handmade leather case for it. So I learned a little bit of different types of crafts as well. But and so you mm -hmm. were telling me that you actually went to was it a, a year long course specifically yeah. on Sami? Yeah, um, specifically on the Nari Sami. So yeah. it was mainly focused on learning the language. But as a part of the course, we also um, obviously got to know more about the culture, and we did have some craft courses and cooking courses and fishing courses as well. We had a whole weekend away fishing because oh, fishing is wow. actually the traditional livelihood of um, Nari Sami. So. That's fascinating. <laughs> yeah. I love that someone has um, developed a course so that mm. people can learn more about it. Yeah, that's um, been around for 12 years now, so it's a fairly new fairly new development. And, and um, who, who were some of your classmates? Is it a, a big mix of people or is it mostly... Yeah, it is a mix of people, but there's only about 10 of us at a time. Yeah. So it's a small group, um, part, partly Sami people, but also... Finns, non-Sami people, just people who are interested in the language and the culture and want to work to um, strengthen it. So, that's wonderful. Yeah, yeah that's wonderful. It was a fun year. Yeah, that sounds fantastic. Yeah, was it experience. full time or? Yeah, full time. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing. What a what a great mm. what a great thing. Um, I don't think we do anything like that in Australia in terms of any of our Aboriginal languages mm. or, or culture. Um. I would be super interested if anyone knows of any of those types of mm. courses available um please let us know in the comments yeah. um mm. so how has has there been any influence of of the of the sami culture on your work or mm. um a little bit i think directly there's one project that's specifically inspired by sami craft but um it's probably in the background and I think the way it impacts me is because it's such a big part of the culture, crafting, and it's really valued highly, um, making making things for yourself. Um, so that part of it is probably like what I live myself as well every day. Yeah. Um, but yeah, this is the cow that I designed for Lina, 52 weeks of shawls. And, and the inspiration for this uh, came from woven shawls that are very traditional and I actually have one here that I have woven and designed myself it's a little bit wrinkly but <laughs> it's absolutely beautiful and um, this is not the traditional colors but of course I had to do something different <laughs> that's so absolutely that. gorgeous mm. and so this was a separate course that you yeah did. I just did that yeah. for fun mm. yeah yeah so right. talented, <laughs> so multi-talented. Yeah, it was lovely to be able to uh, take the time off and actually do things like this. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. And so with this piece, it, mm -hmm. it I guess it's sort of mimicking some of that woven fabric design in yeah. the top. Yeah, so it's got the uh, slip stitch um, plaid pattern and then brioche again. <laughs> I'm sensing there's a recurring a, theme. There's a lot of brioche. <laughs> I actually, this morning when I started putting all of my samples together for this, I realised, oh, this is brioche and this is brioche. And there was just a lot of brioche, but I do like it. And I love um, combining it with different things. And, and like with this one, how it naturally both the techniques do one colour per row. So it's really easy to use them like this in a design and get these fun little transitions happening. So... Yeah. yeah, let's talk a little bit more about yarn selection. We often mm. talk on this um, vlog around um, a, 
trying to find yarn mm. in Australia that's not necessarily mm. part of the pattern. That's obviously less of an issue when we're working with your designs, mm. but you um, worked with a few European yarn producers. Um, and how do you, those European yarns compare to Australian yarns? Can you, how do you, like, are they like for like? Um, what do you need to know when substituting 10 ply in European mm. brands for 10 <laughs> ply in Australian brands? Do you have any suggestions for <laughs> us? Because we struggle with this. Maybe some. <laughs> I don't actually know the UK. I think UK plies are a little bit different mm. here, but I haven't actually worked with them a lot. But um, I think the main factors are really the fibre content and the way it's spun and then thickness, obviously. But the way it's spun does um, create a very differently behaving yarn and that's woolen spun or worsted spun. Um, and I have found that in my test knits, I, I do specify in my patterns which one I've used. Mm -hmm. And if a test knitter uses the other one, then the fabric usually does behave differently. Okay. So that's something to take into account, obviously. And, um, and uh, woolen spun yarns are actually a little bit harder to find here. Um, I know there are some people that are probably bringing some out soon. Yeah. But I'm not going to talk about it yet. I don't know if they. <laughs> I don't know if they are. Unconfirmed. But, uh, <laughs> but um, I think they're coming, um, and that'll be really, really interesting. And I'm looking forward to that. Um, there's obviously a lot of merino available here, and I think over in Europe, it's it's not as like dominant yeah. as it is here so um that's pretty much yeah. everything was merino here merino yeah. plus silk yeah. or merino plus yeah alpaca mm. or... and maybe it's the knitting culture as well but i've noticed that the markets i've done two big markets so it's not a huge amount of experience but um but uh australian knitters too tend to really gravitate towards the really soft fine merinos and the rougher woolen spun or more itchy and scratchy type yarns and they kind of just <laughs> yes yeah <laughs> go so past it a bit more which is fine yeah but there's definitely you can see the cultural difference whereas like we grew up wearing all kinds of knits and woolen socks and and they usually weren't soft merino type knits either like it's you know <laughs> just your standard sort of you average. just get used to it yeah, yeah it's just it's just a fact of life <laughs> like that's yeah. what you have to wear to stay warm so, so, um, and do you find the softer merino tends to work a bit differently when you're knitting it up because you've had mm. a lot of experience with those yeah, other more yeah, rustic yeah, yarns? Yeah, the fabric definitely behaves differently, and sometimes you want that fluidity and the drape, and and uh, it's great, but it's it's good to sort of know how the yarn behaves so you can choose your yarn accordingly. Like, if you want a bit more structure, um, then you're probably better off going for something a little bit coarser or woolen spun. You can even get woolen spuns that are quite soft, but they still have a bit more structure. So the, so the knit is going to sort of have a little bit more shape to it when mm. you wear it as well. So It would be really interesting, wouldn't it, if on Ravelry when people talked about or, or if yarn producers mm. actually started to talk a little bit more about how the yarn was spun, because mm. it's not something you ever really mm. see on labels is it the not the often no. no no i think the first time i heard about the woolen spun yarns was brooklyn twig because they brought out the loft and shelter ah, yarns okay and that's when i sort of became more aware of it and they really love the yarns um and there are and Durero natura sorry i'm butchering the name um they have some really lovely woolen spun yarns they're actually quite soft as well so i've worked with actually actually this one is a woolen spun um um uh, so that's that this cow again so yeah so it's and you can feel the there's a a slight texture to it but it's yeah. not at all scratchy no. it's just um it's like it's a, just like it's got like yeah. a loftiness to yeah. it yeah and it holds shape better as well so yeah. if this was a um, worsted spun yarn it would be a lot more floppy okay so that's kind of a that's a very difference. helpful tip yeah maybe maybe knitting maybe yarn producers will, will evolve to start 
having a little bit more transparency around mm. <laughs> their yeah. spinning process. There's a little bit more of it now, yeah. I think. Yep. And especially if it is a woolen spun yarn, that might get mentioned yep. a bit more now because it's not as common. Mm -hmm. But um, if you know what you're looking for, you can kind of tell, yep. tell as well. Yeah. Yeah. Do you have a favourite design of your own? Mm. I do, yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's not like, okay, yep. Yeah, uh, there are several that I really like, but I think this one will have to be the favourite right And now. this is the EXP. EXP. Yep. 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 Um, I've made we... three of them, so. <laughs> well, obviously, do you wear them? I do, this yep. one especially, because I've had this for over a year now. I've been wearing this a lot, but... Um, yeah, I'm really, uh, really proud of this design and and the process as well, because the EXP actually stands for experimental, short ah. for experimental sweater. Cause ah. it, it just started like with a question again, with the curiosity thing. Just uh, when I was actually, well, I'll show you this one since I'm telling the story. This is my first sweater design that I've designed for Lina. And, uh, and what's this one called? Uh, Viva. Beaver? Yeah, it yeah. means line because it's got lines. Ah, uh, yeah, it's beautiful. <laughs> so original. <laughs> um, that's actually brioche. <laughs> okay, yep. Um, so I was designing this one um, and it's a raglan sleeve um, shaping or what do you call it? Whatever shaping? Yep. Um, so once, when I was working on that and uh, designing the raglan lines, I, I sort of had this idea in my mind like, you know, what could I do differently? And yeah, you know, trying something new. So that's when I sort of thought of this idea of having the, which is just fantastic. Yeah, having the raglan lines actually come and join in the middle and have some really wide. Just yeah, just like what can I do differently? And this is what I came up with. It's and, fabulous. And um, I had to try it. And so was this published um, just? By you, yeah. it wasn't yeah. picked up by anybody. No, that that's just I didn't even I didn't want to give it away to anyone. Okay, it's, <laughs> I it's all yours. Yeah, I want it all yours, and it's fabulous. Yeah, because yeah. I wanted the time to really like play around because I didn't know, yeah, like how many takes like, and that's probably why I have so many because this first one that I did, um, well, I actually knit this twice or the yoke twice because I wasn't happy with how the shaping was. Um, mm -hmm working out it was growing way too much it was becoming very baggy so I redid the yoke and then from this I even tweaked it a little bit and made the neckline a bit smaller and yeah maybe the sleeves a bit longer and there's just little tweaks that happened along the way and I love how you evolved to having the really bold lines done in a contrast mm. color as yeah. well yeah and this um fade it's not an actual fade set it's just uh three sock yarns that I made into a fade set, but I bought that um, years ago from, um, what's that shop in Mornington? Uh, little Woolly Makes. Yeah, yep. yeah, Little yep. Woolly Makes. Yep, we love Little Woolly Makes. Yeah. Little Woolly Makes. <laughs> I think I spent like two hours there, one yep. afternoon. Oh, it's years easy ago. to do, easy yep. to do. <laughs> just choosing my fade colours, because yep. I wanted to make a fade yep. jumper for myself, and then they kept, um, I kept putting it off, I was like, I need to find the perfect pattern. Yep. for them and then when I started thinking of doing a fade with this I was like all right I have that fade set I can pull out now I'm going to make the perfect yeah, pattern why not? this is a fabulous fabulous mm. sweater yeah. it's actually um top of my list to oh. get started on one of these so. nice yeah fabulous cool seeing it but yeah it's really a great way to have fun with color and you can even like use uh Stash yarn because with the if you do a fade you don't need a whole lot mm. of the one color, and then the I'll show you the last one as well. I think this is my actual favorite jumper because it's the newest one probably. But I'm in love with the colorways here. I think yeah. Was this have you posted this one on Instagram recently? Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I kind of commented yeah. on that. That goldy pinky purple and it looks yeah. different in different lights. It's it does. just yeah, all shimmery and magical. Yeah. And when you look at it from the distance, you can't really see the purple much. Yeah. It kind of just blends yeah. into this no, brown gorgeous, ready color. Absolutely colours. stunning. Yeah. Yeah. And that's um, part of 
Pirate Pearl Yarns Blackbeard as, ah. the, as the background colour. Yep. And uh, this one is made with Swiss Yarns. Okay. Um, they're at four ply merino. Yeah, it's beautiful. The contrast colour. Absolutely stunning. And is that just a natural variegation in the yeah. Swiss Yarns? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And it's got three different. It's three different colours. So oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. But they all have a bit of a... Oh, I see that. Yeah. Bit of a, yeah. Gorgeous. Stunning. Yeah. <laughs> and it's reversible. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, wow. So <laughs> it's something I always, <laughs> always want to show off because I love wearing it the other way as well because it has a really nice texture. Yeah. Oh, that's fabulous. Two jumpers in one. Exactly. Perfect. Yeah. I wear it like this as much. Great as for traveling because you yeah, get two jumpers different for looks. Each bust. <laughs> and sometimes you don't want the flashy stripes. Yeah. Like you want something yeah. a little bit more toned down. So yeah. Fantastic. That's that one. And what have you got on your needles at the moment? What what are you allowed to show us? <laughs> <laughs> well, this one I can show you. And that's uh, the overlay vest. I'm working on this is the back piece I've already finished most of the front this is uh, again with very different colors so you, you get a very different vibe I actually love um, black white tan combos and all all its variations it's my favorite I think so that's why a bit more neutral and what else are you working on uh, there's that you're allowed of, to show us? There's <laughs> lots, so many things. I actually you normally have only like one or two projects mm -hmm. on my needles at once because I have deadlines and I just need to get them done. But right now I think I have almost 10. Oh, wow. It's unheard of. Right. <laughs> lots of deadlines. <laughs> some deadlines. Yeah, yeah some deadlines. I have a few. I haven't actually published anything myself for months now since the XP or maybe six like since November. So okay. actually, I'm like in the process of making a few new patterns happen soon. So it's actually a pretty intense time that I've been working on so many things. But um, I'll show you. This one's actually just a swatch at this stage. And this is um, part of the Sami collection that I'm working on. It's actually going to be published in Sami in the calendar. But I will be publishing the patterns in English as well. Like... As, as individual patterns and this is um uh color work for a yoke sweater since they are all the rage or have been for years <laughs> i'm behind the times i still haven't even knit one for myself you've never so, knit a, you've never knit a, a color work no how terrible that you've designed one well yeah yes okay yeah. All right, I, I think we're starting to get an appreciation for just how talented <laughs> Susanna is if we weren't already sure. <laughs> that's incredible. So that's, a, that's sort of um, traditional Sami motifs from woven bands and maybe mittens as well mm -hmm. that I'm going to adjust to suit a yoked sweater. And that's lopey, let's let lopey. So I'm going very traditional with the yoked sweater while I was in Finland. For Christmas, I bought some Loki so I can it's make that. Very textured. Mm. Yeah. Fantastic. But actually, there's a softer uh, New Zealand version that ah. you can use as well. Fantastic. Um, it's very similar, but it's softer. I think it's yep. very nice. So, yeah. yeah. That's beautiful. That's another version with that. <laughs> yeah, and a lot of other things, but I think I can't really talk about anything else. That's just it's. <laughs> If someone hasn't discovered Sanna and Co mm -hmm. and your work yet, where can they find you? Uh, Instagram's the best place. That's where I post fairly regularly. I do, I do have some breaks sometimes. We all need breaks sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I try to keep up with it, but sometimes it doesn't happen. Uh, but Sanna and Co on Instagram. And then I have the story in Ravelry. And Payhip as well. And um, so with Ravelry, mm -hmm. you can access the designs both that you have published yourself mm -hmm. and then also there's a section for some of the ones that are collaborations with yeah. other things to access yeah. them as well. Yeah, Wool Folk and uh, Brooklyn Tweed patterns, there's four of them all, all up. Um, they are available on Ravelry as well. We'll include yeah. links to those in the show notes. Yep. And you occasionally make an appearance at some of Melbourne's markets, mm -hmm. some of Melbourne's craft markets. What have you yep. got coming up this year? 
So, so I've got a few markets coming up this year. I've got All About Fibre and Yarn Festival in Lansfield in June mm -hmm. and Romsey in August. Right. And then there's Bendigo, of course. So ah, I'll be, yes, I Bendigo. I have a stall there for the yep. first time. Fantastic. And the last one will be She's Crafty in October in Castle, Maine. Excellent. So I've got a few. Wonderful. Mm. So if you happen to have a, a copy of Pom Pom Magazine, <laughs> I've heard that Susanna will sign it for you as well. I will. I'm happy, I'm happy to. <laughs> She's so modest. <laughs> like genuinely so modest. You're a bit intimidated when people started coming up and asking yeah. you to sign it. <laughs> happy to do it. But, but it feels a bit weird. <laughs> Fame. Yeah. Fame and... <laughs> <laughs> All right. So um, in our episodes, we always like to pair our craft with a drink pairing. Mm -hmm. um, do you have a favourite beverage to either craft with or, well, you're mostly designing with mm -hmm. or um, or to have afterwards? Is there... What, what's your poison? Um, coffee during mm -hmm. and sometimes wine. But um, I try to keep wine more afterwards. Yes, you can. Good move. Yeah, good move. <laughs> Especially when it, they knits that I have to photograph later, and you know they have to look really good. <laughs> I'm working on a brioche shawl at mm -hmm. the moment, and um, have often done it in front of the television after a glass of wine, mm. and had to redo the rose a little bit more frequently than I think the designer originally intended. Different kind of knits for that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> There should be a category like wine knitting. <laughs> Maybe yeah. we do that. All right, that's the idea. wine knitting design. Yeah. <laughs> good idea. Very good. Yeah. Well, I just want to thank you very, very much mm. for joining us today. No, um, thank you. You've been an absolute delight. Um, Susanna has so many exciting things um coming out i mm -hmm. can't believe you've done so much in just three years so um yeah. watch this space make sure you follow her on instagram to keep up with all <laughs> of her good work and if you're in victoria you might be lucky enough to meet her in person um so thank you again mm, thank you <laughs> it's been fun well i feel like we've met a celebrity um <laughs> seriously celebrity of the knitting world, two um, covers, first international pom-pom, and then the Finnish magazine, um, Tato, which has just been published, um, and another gorgeous sweater design that I would love to knit. Um, Check out Santa's, um, Susanna's Instagram for more pictures of the sweater. It's really gorgeous. Um, and she... She has in conversation and on Instagram let slip that she will be publishing it in English later this year. So um, I think I think I could be convinced to test knit that possibly. I'm always I see call outs for test knits and I'm like, oh, maybe I don't have enough time and I don't want to let people down. But I mean, this is just oh, stunning. I guess with enough lead in, it would be possible. And maybe I could take some holidays. <laughs> I mean, you could. You could. It might be a little bit more difficult with my job. <laughs> uh, just taking three weeks off because I have a test knit to do. Um, <laughs> yeah, I'll have to look at the diary. Anyway. Anyway. Um, but definitely in my queue. Mm, um, it's such a gorgeous sweater. And I love the EXP as well. Um, I, I think... I think, well, I, I said in my interview with Susanna that EXP is top of my list, but it, it really is now after um, trying it on and, and taking some photos with her in it. It's oh. a really, really beautiful knit. And it's not brioche, which is um, a fun thing. It's a different type of stitch. So um, I just love the construction of mm. the, how yep. the shoulders fit. Yeah, um, and the lines and, mm. yeah. Mm. Yeah. Um, I really took away from that interview um, how Susanna has taken her background in design and just seamlessly translated it into these gorgeous knitwear patterns that are so structural and have 
um, quite an architectural component to them. I mean, taking transferable skills from something that analytical and putting it into something um, so beautiful, fluid and artistic. I mean, it's just, it's amazing. I love, I love that. I was really taken with the way that Susanna has committed to her creativity. Um, she talked a couple of times about stepping away from her career to, well, she's stepped away from her career now to forge a new career, which is going very strongly in uh, knitting design. But she certainly um, talked, uh, she took a year off to learn more about Inari Sami culture and to learn the language. Um, and she has just really, and, and I think she, she alluded to that as well, that it is part of that culture that um, beauty and creativity is as important as um, a lot of other ideals of achievement. So I don't know, I found that really inspiring. Um, I, the idea of, of taking time just to lean into creativity instead of trying to achieve by um, Western Australian American ideals of achievement, um, a step it. away from that. Mm. Getting off the ladder. Getting off no. the ladder. <laughs> yeah. So, um, but there's a real piece about her. I think oh, yes. Um, yes. that comes across in the interview. Um, she's considered and mindful and she might disagree <laughs> with that if we asked her, um, but that's certainly how she comes across um, in real life. Mm. It was an absolute joy to interview her. Mm. And we're looking forward to, I mean, we're, we're looking forward to getting to know her a bit better. Um, we've been in contact since and there might be um, some some further stuff coming up with her maybe in the future so um, mm. watch mm. the space for that yeah yeah we'd love to know um maybe drop it in the comments if you were going to make an overlay sweater what colors would you like to make it in mm. absolutely mm. so many color options oh, endless <laughs> i know this is another story in my life <laughs> trying to pick colors well, we might wrap it up there. Um, thank you very much for watching. Um, hopefully you can hear us over the snoring of Murphy here. Um, He's falling asleep on the job. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very hard life. Um, please um, comment. We love to hear from you. Um, please subscribe to our, our vlog or podcast um, if you've enjoyed what you're watching and would like to see more interviews and well, all the other random stuff that we do. Um, what else? Thumbs up. Thumbs up is great. Thumbs up is great. You can also love us on Instagram. Um, we share quite regularly um, posts sometimes themed to our most recent episode or sometimes again as we are a bit random things that we're working on <laughs> thank you very much for watching lovely ones um have a lovely day or evening wherever you are and we'll see you again soon happy knitting bye <laughs>